something. So this calendar example, um, we could have waited, we could have built a whole app, we could have built out an entire product experience, but we knew that the most important thing to test was the content, whether that was actually gonna be valuable. And I think you can always get scrappier, you can always get more focused and validate the very first thing that is underlying that bigger assumption, that bigger vision that you have. Related to all of this is false positives. So like I mentioned, uh, skimmers love us. They love giving us feedback, but they also love telling us that they love us. And that's wonderful. It makes me feel really warm and fuzzy. Uh, but also sometimes it's hard to not think that everything you create is amazing because sometimes for them, they just want anything that we build. And sometimes that means that, you know, four months from now, it, it's not necessarily going to be a strong, engaged product. It's just something they wanted in the moment. Um, and so for us, it's really important to uh, figure out how to train our whole employee base, not just our insights team, on how to really listen to that feedback and also, you know, form user testing scripts and really understand how to extract the ex exact insights that you want. I think pricing is the best example of this. Again, pricing is really hard. Willingness to pay tests are really hard. For us, it's exceptionally hard. People will tell us, I'll pay 20 bucks a month for that. Absolutely. And guess what? They would turn out two months later. So it's really important to figure out how to structure our testing and to make sure we're really extracting the, the clear objective insights from this. The last thing that's really important for us is brand. Uh, brand, brand, brand. Uh, brand is so important to who we are and what we do. And it's really, really important that a product team embodies that. And so I think what's interesting about that is that a lot of times I see PMs and product teams operate in what I call product swim lanes and silos. So as a PM, your job is to ship and to build and to figure out what you build. And it's really easy to just get caught up in that and just do that. At our company, that isn't going to cut it because there's so much more that goes into product development than product design and engineering. And so it's about extending. It's about thinking about how the brand, the voice, the editorial content, the community, all of that needs to go into the product that you're creating, not just the features and the design. And so for us, something that's worked really well is that we've expanded the concept of a product development squad. So some of you might have this at your companies, a pod, a squad, whatever you want to call them. It's a cross-functional team, often product design, engineering, working towards together towards a goal, towards shipping and iterating and building a product. We have taken that model and actually expanded it to include marketing, editorial, and often insights and analytics, sometimes even sales, because we want all of those voices and all of those stakeholders actually involved in building the product. My favorite is watching editorial be on a product development squad because they are they are the product. For us, content is that product. And so for them, you know, being part of that development process, iterating on it, ideating, you know, it's so, so critical to who we are and what we do. And it would be way too easy for product design and engineering to go over here and build some cool product interfaces and for the rest of the company to be kind of creating the layers above it and the things that go into it. And so this was really core to our culture from day one to make sure that product development embodied more than what is traditionally involved in product development. I also think figuring out how to create a product strategy that actually leans into your brand and what your brand stands for is super important. So for us, our product strategy at its core is how can we fit information and utility together in a way that delivers confidence to you? And what I mean by that is it's not just about the utility of a product and it's not just about the information, it's those two things actually coming together to give somebody just the amount of information they need to know to go about their day. So whether it's the email newsletter, the calendar, the texting product, an audio podcast, it doesn't matter. All of these things are delivering a piece of information that has a utility behind it. And that, again, is not just a product strategy. It's a product strategy that centers, that has a center point around who we are as a brand and our mission statement as a brand. And then lastly, uh, I probably said this a few times now, but uh, it's again, it's just so easy to underestimate how brand, editorial voice, community, all of these things that sometimes as product people we think of as like the icing on the cake or kind of the thing at the end, and, or just like a marketing thing, is actually so critical to the relationship that your products have with your audience. This is all one thing. And I think uh, I, I put some kind of feedback and some tweets, some things from our ambassador group. Um, I think it shows itself here. 
fear because the way people talk about the scam in our products is just different. They feel like we're their actual friend. They feel like it's a brand that they can that speaks to them, that uh, that gives them the value that they need throughout their day, and that is not delivered with just a utilitarian product that is delivered with all these things working together. And that is something that is so is core to our product culture and core to kind of who we are as a company. So let's talk about a couple of frameworks to actually apply some of this. Some of this might feel a little specific to the skim, but I promise it's not because everybody can do this. Uh, so the first is audience obsession. So I think audience obsession is a commonly used term, but and I think it often is, speaks to how do you have data, how do you have research, how are you always incorporating customer feedback. But again, not enough people talk about how that is embedded into your company culture and how it's in the je ne sais quoi of, of the, the, a day in the life of your company. And what are people saying when they're in a meeting room without product design in the room? How are they talking about your users or skimmers? Uh, there's so much that goes into audience obsession that isn't just the product team. And that is really important at the stakeholder level and also at the like one-on-one -on -one conversations that happen at your company every single day and seeing and making sure that everybody really does value your audience feedback, what the problems that you're solving for your audience, and it's really critical to how you see the success of your company. And so I, I see it as a really simple triangle. I think it's the actual data, which is what is what is your audience actually doing and how are they engaging. It's the research behind that. It's what are they saying? What are they feeling? What is their affinity to your brand? And then again, it's that company culture. It's saying how is that language just embedded in the core of how all your employees go about their day? The next is what I like to call the brand checklist. So uh, first and foremost, think about your brand assets. What are our strongest assets? What words do people use to describe us and the value that they derive from our products? Audience relationship, so how can we actually deliver that emotional connection with our products, not just the utility behind it? And the third is people, so who is actually key to integrating brand into everything that we do, and how do I take them and embed them into my product development process? So that they don't just come in at the end, they're part of everything that we do. And that's all. So last thing, I would be remiss if I didn't say that I wanted feedback <laughs> because that was core to what I just talked about. So would love if you could fill out an NPS survey on this talk and I would love to iterate on it. Thank you. All right, we're gonna pass out mics for questions um, so that we can pick them up on the recording. Cool. Just raise your hands. Hi, thank Hi. you so much. Um, very informative session. Um, I had a question about, so you were the first PM at ESPN, yes. and that meant you, you know, you really, I guess, got to create the strategy and the organizational culture for product. How do you decide to take the risk to go to the skim? Like, what were the criteria you were thinking about? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, wasn't planning on it. So uh, my goal with leaving ESPN was to take what I'd applied and learn into something totally different. So my plan was to leave media, go to a whole different challenge, try something new, but that wasn't gonna be an early stage startup. I ended up meeting the Skim founders. They didn't know what product was. I didn't know what they were doing. And we had this hilarious conversation where I was trying to explain to them product and they were like, where's your portfolio? Do you code? Like it was just a hilarious like two hour confusing conversation. We ended up hitting it off. And I think the turning point for me in that conversation was that uh, I wanted to take all these things that I learned about organizational design, product culture, the good and the bad, uh, and building for like an obsessive audience, which I felt like I had a sweet spot around, and then building that from scratch. Because when I joined, there was no product design engineering. It was so fun to recreate product culture at a company that I felt like was audience obsessed. So that concept of like editorial on a squad did that from day one. And that was so much fun. So it was definitely a leap of faith. Like it was scary to join a 10 person startup, but like the challenge of taking the good and bad of what I had learned and figuring out my version of that was the coolest thing in the world, so. Thanks, enjoyed that. Um, very easy question. Well, what do you mean by diaries? 
Oh, yeah, totally. So uh, our insights team loves to do this thing called diary studies where they, depending on the thing that we're trying to solve for, so for example, uh, I think about a year ago they did a news habits diary study where they recruited a group of 30 people from our skim audience and they had them log their news habits and consumption over the course of a week in like a diary format. And like literally it was just like bulleted lists. Um, and so, and it wasn't just the things that they were consuming like, oh, I went to CNN or oh, I saw you know, an article. It was also, when do I have a question that I can't answer because I don't know the answer to it? So it might be a dinner conversation. It might be a work kind of water cooler thing. We wanted to figure out like when could we hit them in those moments. Um, another one that we did was just mobile routines. So we actually had them uh, download. I forget the name of the app, but it's one of those apps that like tracks the time on your phone. This was before Apple rolled that out. And we had them download that, and we just tracked their uh, app usage every single day so we could understand what types of apps they're using on their phone. That's where we got the calendar messaging and email as the top three apps that our audience uses. We try to refresh that on a constant basis because there's new things that are changing. But it's generally just like broad strokes, you know, what is this audience doing? What problems do they have? It's not with like a specific product in mind. I think, yeah, there we go. There's a mic right there. Oh. <laughs> Hi, um, thanks so much for the talk, it was wonderful. I've uh, been a skimmer since the beginning. Yay! Yeah, well, I love the skim, skimmer. so it's so super exciting to hear that. Um, so 